Two centuries before the first Europeans arrived in Australia, a seed germinated on the Murray River floodplain. Against enormous odds, that seed grew to become this giant river red gum. This is the story of one season in the tree's ongoing struggle to survive. Born in flood, this 400-year-old river red gum has been waiting at least 20 years to consign its seed to the floodwaters of Australia's greatest river. But floods are now rare. The most familiar of Australia's 800 eucalypts, river red gums grow from the tropical north to the temperate south, but always close to water. On the fringes of the world's largest river red gum forest in southeastern Australia, the tree taps dwindling reserves of groundwater deep below the surface of the Murray River floodplain. Here, there is drought. Dams and weirs have stifled the forest's lifeblood. The river red is under stress and under siege from a host of enemies. An animal may fight or flee, but the river red moored in the floodplain can only confront its foes. Thousands of tiny mouths constantly consume its leaves and siphon its sap. But over the ages, the river red has assembled a unique defensive arsenal and recruited a few allies. The river red is not just a plant, but an ecosystem, a hub around which many other life cycles revolve. Wood swallows, pardalotes, it supports a particularly rich community of birds. The tree transforms sunlight into cellulose and sugars to be converted into insect protein and fat. The more insects, the more birds. The river red not only provides food, but shelter. Now, in middle age, the tree is full of hollows that make perfect nursery chambers for possums and birds. In return for lodgings, these residents return nitrogen and phosphate to the tree through their droppings. As the tree ages and depletes the surrounding soil, these extra nutrients help maintain its growth. And as the tree grows, its interior designers are still hard at work. A mature tree may host a million termites, a million mouths scattered through its interior, working as one. The four kilogram colony may consume up to three times its weight in wood each year. In time, the tree's trunk and boughs become riddled with hollows. And as the termites move on, the animals move in. Friend and foe dine on the leaves, sap and nectar of this living larder. But the tree has ensured that nobody enjoys a free lunch. A sticky wax coating the young, nutrient-rich leaves clogs the claws, antenna and jaws of leaf beetles, slowing their feasting. They can waste precious time and energy cleaning it off or go elsewhere.
larger Christmas beetles target older leaves, slowly wearing away their mandibles on the tough tissue. In this endless biological war, the tree counters other predators with its chemical defences. Glands of toxic eucalypt oil stud its leaves, while tannins make leaf proteins difficult to digest. But strategy is met with counter-strategy. The larvae of leaf skeletonizing insects feed delicately, avoiding the oil glands and tough veins. Other insects are allies. An assassin bug is on the prowl. Through a thousand brief battles, nature maintains a dynamic balance and constructs a lifetime measured in centuries. In the cool of the evening, the sounds of battle change. As the birds settle into the river red's hollows, the night shift emerges. Sugar gliders have marked out the river red as their territory. Families of up to seven may share a hollow. Gliders feed on the River Red's sugary sap. Unable to see in colour, their eyes are attuned to shape and movement. They snack on camouflaged insects that have eluded the feathered day shift. A young brush-tailed possum makes a less palatable find. A cluster of spitfires, larvae of the sawfly wasp. Spitfires are well named. Disturbed, they ooze a noxious concentrate of eucalypt oil. Spitfires use the tree's own most potent weapon. The toxic oil protects them as they feed on its leaves. The young brush tail ventures a first and last taste. These skunks of the insect world have few predators. <laughs> A much larger leaf eater has also pierced the tree's chemical defences. The River Red's greatest nemesis, the koala, may eat half a kilogram of eucalypt leaves in a night. It ferments them in the longest gut of any Australian marsupial. But relative to its size, the koala has one of the tiniest brains of any Australian mammal. Its odd anatomy and slow movement reflect the high metabolic cost of its toxic diet. At dawn, after four hours feasting, the koala is full and ready to spend the next 20 hours sleeping while it digests its meal. Hardly a routine requiring a big brain. Natural selection seems to have shrunk the koala's brain to conserve energy.
To human eyes, the forest may seem timeless and permanent, but the river reds face a constant struggle to exist and reproduce their kind. They survive by resisting their enemies and supporting their defenders. But a new player now intrudes into the equation. Against this predator, the River Red has no defence. Fortunately, this man's mission is benign. He is helping to spread the River Red's genes. His unorthodox method allows him to reach the fresh seeds from last year's growth, high in the tree. These seeds will found new man-made forests. River Reds now thrive in plantations in more than 100 countries on six continents. The Barma Forest is the world's largest treasury of these precious genes. Ironically, it has been cut back to only a quarter of its original area in just 130 years. Axemen felled the forest's giants last century. Paddle steamers plying the river devoured the hard red wood. It made ideal railway sleepers, bridge piers, pylons. And all the while, on the forest's fringe, farms ate into the fertile floodplain. But it's nature, not humans, that defines the boundary where farmland yields to the forest. This year, those who have crossed it will be reminded of the risks. Each year, spring storms water the forest on their eastward transit across the continent. This storm is slow moving and unusually intense. It breaks on the slopes of the Great Divining Range, 200 kilometres to the east, and then flows backward towards the floodplain. Repeated flooding has built up the banks that confine the river's flow. Swollen by the deluge, the Murray River breaks free. The river sends exploratory tendrils down through the forest. The River Reds welcome this overture to a long overdue phase of renewal. But for life on the forest floor, the transition is catastrophic. Creatures that rarely see the light of day are flushed from their refuges to take their chances with the flood.
As it courses through the forest, the water mobilizes and redistributes nutrients. The gullies and low-lying areas fill first, but soon the water is everywhere. The river reclaims its ancient floodplain. The rapidly rising water catches lowlanders unprepared. On the forest's fringe, others suffer. In reclaiming its dominion, the Swollen River recognises no man-made border between forest and farmland. Those who ventured furthest in search of the fertile legacy of past floods now pay the heaviest price. Adapted to long immersion, the river reds begin pumping water into their canopies, fueling vigorous new growth. And other predators now flood into the forest to feast. Instead of birds, hungry perch now glide between the trees in search of insects. Along the river's drowned banks, enormous fish seek protection amid the red gum's exposed roots and prepare to breed. The Murray Cod, the largest of Australia's freshwater fish. Among the sunken branches of the River Red, golden perch also take the rising water's cue to spawn. In 24 hours, the hovering storm dumps a billion tonnes of water over a region already saturated by record spring rains. Huge tracts of northeastern Victoria are underwater tonight in the region's worst floods on record. Around 2,000 people, many suffering severe shock, have been evacuated from Benalla and nearby towns including Euroa and Violet Town. Upstream, the dams overflow. For the first time in more than a decade, the Murray breaks its bonds. In places, it's now several kilometres wide. As the water rises, many water birds experience a surge in sex hormone levels. Ibis breed only when the water below is at least a metre deep. Trapped in a watery maze, kangaroos struggle to reach the few remaining patches of high ground.
Starvation adds to the toll already taken by exhaustion. The River Red's tough, tannin-laden bark is no substitute for green grass. For others, the flood is a small inconvenience. Koalas rarely descend to the ground, travelling above the flood where the forest's branches interlace. Finally, for the forest and most of its residents, a time of plenty is coming. The flood reaches the very edge of the floodplain, rejuvenating the 400-year-old River Red with its nutrient-laden waters. The tree will grow more in the next few months than it has in several years. With its roots tapping recharged groundwaters 10 metres below, it will have insurance against future droughts. And at last, from its canopy, it consigns a precious rain of millions of tiny seeds to the floodwaters, to a chance at life. Life erupts in the forest canopy as birds fly in from all around the country to feed and breed. Kookaburras pair up with their mates from seasons past, as do red-rumped parrots. As more and more creatures swarm into the forest, the competition for living room becomes intense. Floodwaters teem with crustaceans, insects and fish. A feast to invest in the next generation. In the crush, sacred ibis and little pied cormorants set up a communal nest. As the river retreats, the floodplain experiences its own renaissance. It explodes with colour and the air is full of insects. Already the River Red is preparing for its next cycle. For a reward of nectar and pollen, bees remix its genes. Every seed will contain a unique blueprint for another giant tree. After a lull in the battle, the flood's wealth begins to trickle down through the forest's economy. The battle is about to be rejoined, but the tree has launched a new generation, fulfilling its biological imperative. Seed harvesters will steal billions of seeds lodged in the mud, yet millions will still germinate. Most of the infant river reds will succumb to other forces, both natural and alien.
Four centuries ago, the River Red was itself a seedling. Against the odds, it survived and may yet live to eight centuries. In all this time, only a few of its seedlings will survive to become travellers in time like their great parent. But these few will help perpetuate and refine its genetic legacy. For now, in the face of all the forces ranged against it, the Bama forest endures. Time and tide, its natural allies. <laughs> 